So we're here at the Giga Ohm Roadmap. So who are you? I'm Brady Forrest and I run Highway One. It's a San Francisco based hardware incubator with ties to Shenzhen. So what does it mean, the uh, hardware incubator? Well, so we work with companies that are learning, trying to learn how to manufacture our product. So we have 11 companies in this current cohort. Uh, they all have something that they want to scale up. They all have prototypes and they all want to figure out how do they go from making one or two to say 10,000, 20,000, 100,000. So like people have s s special hardware ideas, right? Is that uh -huh. what it is? Yeah. So we have companies that are in the medical space. One person's working on a pain band-aid. Another person's working on, another team really, is working on a flu testing kit. Another team is working on connected jewelry. Another team is working on a connected scale. So it's possible to do new ideas in Shenzhen? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So how, how does that work? Well, so these companies, uh, most of them are US based, but some are from Europe and we're looking for uh, teams from Asia for future ones. Uh, they come to us, they work with us, we have engineers who advise them and help them figure out how to actually get their, their prototype that they made at home ready for production. And then uh, we're going to take them to Shenzhen and give them factory tours so they can kind of understand how things actually get made. Because that, that scaling process is kind of is a mystery to people. And that's what we want to enlighten them on. And then most of them, but not necessarily all of them, plan on getting their products made in Shenzhen. So are you, are you saying that uh, it's, you were saying on stage that it can be easy to make just one, but it's really hard to make 10,000 or a large That's, number. Absolutely. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is one, you are working on it by hand and it's possible for someone to make something by hand. But if you're going to make 10,000 of something, then you need other people to make it for you. Usually with, you know, a smart assisted robot, so that way it's actually made the same way. And there's consistency to the product and with, without rigor applied to it and a like a lot of planning for how you're actually going to make something and testing yield rates then you will end up with a lot of junk at the end of a manufacturing run. So uh, Highway One, right, mm -hmm. is a company that's uh Part of another uh, PCH? Yeah, so Highway One is funded by PCH. PCH International is an Irish company with primary operations in Shenzhen. Uh, they are a large supply chain management company and they handle really, really large supply chains. Uh, ship about 10 billion in product a year. Uh, ten, they handle 10 million SKUs a day uh, for all different types of companies, including a lot of startups. So Little Bits, for example, is a startup that they do work with where they make the little bits for them and ship them. And what we learned from working with startups is that they don't just have a low order volume problem, but they also have a knowledge problem, and that's where Highway One comes in. So Highway One is about education and prototyping, getting yourself ready for production. And then after that, sometimes PCH will take those companies and help them make their product and ship it. Did you say 10,000 SKUs per day? What 10 million. Mean? 10 million SKUs per day. So PCH works with a lot of large companies and they actually move more than 10 million individual products per day. 10 million individual, like, uh, not different products, but individual yeah. products. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, what, you were talking on stage about where do you come from? What, what was your, what were you doing before? Uh, I have a... I have an engineering degree from RPI in industrial engineering. I did supply chain management for a while, consulting and systems integration. Then I went to Consumer Web and I ended up at Microsoft where I worked on what became Bing. And then I went to O'Reilly Media where I hosted tech conferences and I started Ignite, which is a geek talk format and event that spread around the world. I then uh, helped out 500 Startups, which is an incubator and seed fund here in the Valley. And I worked at Coastal Ventures for a while. So did you say you started Bing? I worked on what became Bing. You worked on what, well, can you talk about So I worked about on that? MSN Search while I was at Microsoft and back in the very early days. So MSN, you know, it's been around for a long time, I think in the mid 90s, and they used to outsource the results to Ink to Me, which was later bought by Yahoo. And in, I believe it was 2003, 2002, 2003, uh, Christopher Payne, who was an executive at Microsoft, former executive at Amazon, went to Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer and said, I want to go take on Google and I want to create our own search index. And so I was part of that team that worked on the very beginning of what ended up becoming Bing. 
So Bing was a later rebranding effort that happened well after I left, but the original kernel of the code and the thinking behind it was part of the team that I worked on. I'm just going to guess here, but uh, Microsoft makes most of its money licensing software, like, uh -huh. uh, Windows, yeah. I guess. Uh, and it hasn't moved that much in the last 10 years, right? Uh, into being more of a cloud company or has, I mean... Oh, I think, I, I mean, know. they're making a lot of valiant efforts. I don't think it's really paid off for them financially, but they've, you know, you can point to some things like Xbox Live is a true cloud success for them. Azure is starting to get some amount of traction, but Bing, by all accounts, although it's got a lot of traffic and is gaining a search share and the ads are coming around, still is a money loser for them. And uh, maybe it's gaining because it's default, you know, when people buy a computer? Maybe. Oh, I'm just guessing. Part of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's part of buying traffic. That's what people do. But it's definitely what they need to do, is get into more making more money on cloud. Well, that's why they did and the maybe, Yahoo deal. Uh, yeah. To, to have more people use their search results. I mean, search is the type of business where the more data you get, the better your results get. So Google has an almost insurmountable advantage by having, I think it's 70% of the market share because they're more likely to hit something that's in the cache. They're more likely to know what somebody is searching for and they have data about what is the right click. Bing with only 20% is just further behind and it's hard for them to catch up. But they need to do much, much more, I guess. Oh, or there continue. could be other things for them to other do things, instead. Yeah. So. Uh, so then, then you then you said uh, ignite. Uh -huh. Is that uh, is that uh, where people do very short presentations? Yeah. So it's, it's so it's something I started in Seattle in 2006, and people get five minutes on stage, 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide. It's since spread to over 200 cities around the world, and uh, you know we get about 12 speakers at a time up on stage, and they get to be rock stars, and that doesn't happen very often. So it's kind of awesome. So. Uh, Thousands and thousands of Ignite presentations have been made so thus far. Oh, yeah. They're all so, online. Um, uh, many of them are online. I can't say that they're all yeah. online because I haven't done them all. So the idea was uh, you don't want people to stay too long on stage, right? Uh, well, it's more that I don't want the audience to get bored. So I want the audience to be there. I wanted, you know, as, an audi as a potential audience member, I want to get a lot of ideas at once. And then I can follow up on the ones that are more interesting. And it can be funny. Oh, yeah. They're usually funny. Usually funny. And... Uh, because the talks, because the slides are going so fast, people don't um, actually always do their talk correctly. So they're working on, you know, catching up, and it ends up for some pretty funny scenarios at times. And uh, but did it's you also say great training for a potential speaker. It's a good use of uh, PowerPoint. It's a great use of PowerPoint. Yeah. How about uh, did you say uh, 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 these conferences you did O'Reilly? Uh huh. Yeah. What was that? I chaired a lot of conferences at O'Reilly, at probably about 20 events over the years. I did the Web2 Expo, which was a focus on web technologies. I did Where2O, -Oh, which was for six years, which was a geo and mapping conference. I did eTech, which dug into hardware a little bit. I did eTel, which is a telephony conference. Android Open, which was an Android conference. Fluent, which is another web technologies conference. So a lot of events over the years. Plus Food Camp, which is an invite-only camp. Uh, a conference that O'Reilly throws up at its headquarters. How can I get an invite? Yeah, uh, well, I can introduce you to them. Uh, I don't, I don't control the guest list anymore. Actually, I never really did, but I used to have more influence than I do now. So, what do you think about conferences now? Could, could they improve? Like with some kind of Google Glass at the entrance, everybody can have overlaid information about everybody and somehow. What do you think? Um, I think that could be handy. I think there's something to. There's a balance. You want that type. Of, everybody wants that type of information, and people, most people going to a conference, want to share that information with the other people who are going to be there. I mean, they're there to make connections. There's a reason why conferences haven't gone all virtual. Actually, I'd say there's two reasons. One is the focus. You're out of the office, and so you can actually focus on the content and what's happening there. The second is to make connections. And different people go for different reasons, but I bet those are the top two. So having that type of information and knowing who in the room or who within the 10 feet of you you're more likely to want to talk to or have a good connection with would be really important. But I'd say that applies to a lot of scenarios, like, say, dating or at a club, when you'd want to know that. So you have to balance the needs of some versus the privacy of all. So uh, hardware is awesome, right? Mm -hmm. this hardware is, is you... awesome, but hardware is also hard. And like I said, I mean, in my presentation earlier today, prototyping, I don't want to say it's solved, but it's a lot easier 
I mean, one of our companies actually used Little Bits, which is a magnetic circuits to get a, to build their first prototype and figure out like, oh, will this actually work? And so you don't have to have become a double E to make a working hardware gadget. You can make that one prototype. However, to build 10,000 or 100,000, that's when you need to like bring in different skills and perhaps more experienced people. So it's like Arduino, there's uh, maybe the embed platform Arm is suggesting, yeah. all these rapid prototyping platforms They're and you turn awesome. this you turn this into mass produce things. Yeah. That's the trick. We right? help them do that, yes. And somehow you basically cut out the stuff that's not needed and then board and stuff. And yeah, well I mean Arduinos are expensive for manufacture and they are slower than needed in a lot of cases. So it's rare that Arduino goes to production. But Arduino is amazing for figuring out what your prototype should do. So do you think that uh, these crowdfunding uh, hardware projects, for example, mm -hmm. which might be some of the people working with you, mm -hmm. is going to be, well, it's already like changing everything. Oh yeah, I mean crowdfunding is great for two things. It's great for marketing and finding users, so engaging consumer demand, and then so basically like reaching your audience, proving that your product has value to someone other than you, and then two, it provides startups with really, really necessary working capital. A, uh, another dirty myth of hardware is the amount of money it takes to make the product. And you have to do that, you have to convince the company that there's enough business in it for them to, for them to take their time to set up the line. Two, you have to fund out months in advance of a product. So you're looking at about 10 weeks worth of inventory that you have to build up, which can be a lot of money for a small startup. All right. so. Looking forward to see what happens. Thanks, yeah. And our applications for our spring class are open now. You can find it at highway1.io.